Well, thank you, Mark, and thanks for the uh, introduction. To be completely transparent, when I come to an event like this, I'm sometimes anxious or feeling awkward because I truly never know what words are, are going to come out of my mouth. So I guess maybe what I'll do is I'll start by, by telling you that I didn't join the RCMP to be an assistant commissioner. I didn't join the RCMP to uh, be in a setting like this, talking about matters relating to leadership and transparency. I joined the RCMP because I wanted to make a difference. And early on in my career, uh, my passion, frankly, was simply catching bad guys. So I think what I'd like to do this morning is I would like to share some of the, I'll call them stories, but investigations that I was a part of that formed the foundation or the building blocks of my career. And then uh, I'll take any questions that you may have with respect to any current or topical issues on the heels of that. So as I said, when I joined, I, my passion was, was catching bad guys. And I had about two years service, two and a half years service. And there were a group of uh, men that were going into stores and uh, firing shots into the ceiling, scaring the community in a pretty significant way creating concern within the law enforcement community. And I had an interest in handling confidential human informants, and I really enjoyed dealing with the criminal element. I learned that there was a stolen car up at a um, private residence up in uh, North Surrey. And I thought to myself, if I go up there and I arrest these guys with that stolen car, I could cultivate them as an informant and get information on this group of individuals that is really terrorizing the Lower Mainland. So my partner and I went up there. We were um, watching the property, and it wasn't very exciting to be sitting there watching the property. So I said to my partner, <clears throat> why don't we go up and look in the window, and we'll see if the car's there. If it is, then we'll move the, uh, the investigation forward accordingly. So I went up, I looked in the window, I saw a car in the garage, wrote down the license plate. My partner um, queried it on our computer systems. Stolen car, exactly what I'd been told was there. He went back, <clears throat> got a search warrant. We executed the search warrant. We arrested the two men that were in the house. And I was uh, in the throes of trying to interview one of them, a male by the name of Terry Zimmerman. And he had a broken, I broke my hand a couple times. He had a broken hand. He was being what I'll describe as um, obstinate with me. He wasn't particularly friendly. He wasn't willing to talk too much, which seemed inconsistent with why he was there. He was a very bad guy, arrested for a stolen car. There was a knock on the door, and the, I opened the door, and the sergeant uh, from Major Crime, who at that time was a very important person in my, my detachment at Surrey, said to me, Billy, I need to talk to you. I stepped outside, and he said, that guy killed the guy last night. We need you to shut down your interview. So I thought to myself, OK. And then I started to think about what I had done. I had walked on the property. I had looked in the window. Now, I'll just maybe pause for a second to say that in Canada, as you know, there's an expectation of privacy. And my actions were not completely in accordance with the boundaries of the law that law enforcement officers must work within. At no point did I ever think I would ever be going to court on this. My goal was to cultivate him as an informant. So I went to my supervisor <clears throat> and I said, Doug, I need to talk to you. This is what I've done. And he provided me with constructive criticism <laughs> in the <laughs> nicest way possible that I can frame up in a public setting. And I then went on to write, get my notebook out and write out everything that I had done. I walked on the property, I looked in the window, and I, you know, it was a um, difficult thing to do. So then I got my, he was charged with murder, and I got my court notification, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go to court, and I'm going to have to say all the things that I had done. And, um, you know, I was feeling horrible that I had made that mistake and I could potentially compromise an investigation. There was one murder in Canada that night, and I happened to arrest the guy who had done it. He ended up pleading guilty, but in that process, 
I promised myself that I would never ever work outside the boundaries of the law again. And I would never ever allow anybody that I worked with to work outside the boundaries of the law. There is a rule of law, there's a reason we have it, we must be respectful of it. The end does not justify the means in any capacity. And I tell you that because that really was the foundation and has been the foundation of my approach to how we, how I should do my job and how the teams that I ultimately have come to lead should do our job. So on the heels of that incident, I then continued on with my career, ultimately working in serious crime section in Surrey, the serious crime unit, at a time that predated the inception of the Integrated Homicide Investigation Team that you may know as I hit. Our primary mandate was homicide. I did that until I had about eight years service and I transferred to Burnaby where I was put in the position of officer in charge of serious crime. I went into a unit as the most junior person in the unit. Almost immediately, um, there was a young lady by the name of Kim Tracy. She was 28 years old, single mother, had an eight-year-old son. And she went out with a girlfriend to a club in Vancouver called Jaguar's Pub. And she and her girlfriend had a number of drinks. And while they were there, they met two gentlemen. As the night came to a close, they left the establishment and they went to this male's house by the name of Lance Dove. And they had a couple of drinks. And at that time, Lance started to make some advances towards Kim sexual advances, and she was not interested in those advances and was not attracted to him in that way. So she left his house and proceeded to walk home along Marine Way in Burnaby. Lance left the house too. He followed her. He pulled her into the bushes. He raped her. He beat her. And he left her there naked on the side of the road in the, in the uh, blackberry bushes. And I tell you that because that predated the arrest of Robert Picton. So the following day, it received significant media coverage and attention. We had a young lady found roadside deceased, clearly the victim of foul play. One of the things that you do in an investigation, as you can imagine, is you have to deal with the family, the next of kin. And as I stand here right now, I have a very clear a recollection of going to Kim's mother's house. She was an elderly lady. She was on a ventilator. And on the wall in the living room where I uh, was holding her hand, there were pictures of Kim and her son uh, throughout the course of their lives. And um, it was kind of surreal. And <clears throat> Kim's mother uh, was crying, and she held my hand. And she asked me to promise that I would get her daughter's killer. So I, I pause here and I ask you to ask yourself what you think you might say at that particular point. So I gave her my answer. And I went back to the office. And when I walked in the office, I was told by our investigative team that I was in charge of. I was the team commander. And as the team commander, my job is to oversee the investigation in its entirety. I was told that two guys were driving down the road listening to the radio, and one of the guys, the driver, said to his passenger as they were talking about this found body, hmm, I wonder if that's Kim. We should maybe go tell the cops what we know. Not realizing that the passenger, Lance Dove, is the killer. So they come into the, I come in, and the guys tell me, okay, we're going to take a statement from him. We'll kind of get the facts, and then we'll give him his rights to counsel. I told you earlier about worst-case scenario happening, and it happened to me that night. I said, no, we're not. I said, we're going to stop this interview right now. We're going to advise him of his rights to counsel, his right to call a lawyer, and we're going to advise him of his right to remain silent. And then we will move forward with our investigation in a manner that is keeping with the expectations of the courts and will enhance the likelihood of anything that flows from this process to be admissible. So we did that, 
and um, Lance exercised his right to consult counsel. We then are now faced with the um, allocation of responsibilities. And as a team commander, I assign those responsibilities. And I assigned a police officer with 28 years service, very experienced, to assume carriage of the interview of Mr. Dove. He embarks upon that interview process. A couple hours later, he comes out and says, Billy, this guy's never going to confess. So you can imagine how I felt. You know, not seven or eight hours earlier, I was holding her, Kim's mother's hand as she's crying. I promised her that I would catch her daughter's killer. So I looked around at the people that were available to assume carriage of that interview, and what do you think I did? I went in myself. I went in, I spoke to him for a couple hours, and I thought to myself, Billy, you're an idiot. You shouldn't be in here. That's not your job. You're supposed to be outside running the investigation, making sure everything else is happening. So I, I ended up shutting that interview down in the early hours of the evening or morning, I guess, depends what you want to look at it. I went home, I got a couple hours sleep, and as I was driving back into work the next day, I was thinking about, okay, now what are we going to do? How am I going to advance this in a meaningful way? We had the guy in custody that we felt was the killer. By the way, sorry, I left out that he was covered in cuts and bruises, and it was clear there was evidence that would suggest he had been in blackberry bushes, and he was the last person with her. So I phoned the best two interviewers that I knew in the province of British Columbia. I phoned Jim Hunter, he was the polygraph examiner, and he was on his way to Ottawa to teach the polygraph course. I then phoned Don Adam, who uh, the name may ring a bell, he later ran the Picton investigation. And I phoned Don, and Don was on his way to go kayaking with his daughter, uh, Maddie. So neither one of them was available. So when I got back in the detachment, second lar largest detachment in the country, I looked around at all the resources available to me. And what do you think I did? I told you earlier I wasn't that smart. Yeah, I, went, I went back in the room. <clears throat> and I spent five hours with Dove, Mr. Dove. And he ultimately chose to unburden himself and um, you know, take responsibility for what he had done to her the night before. So it sounds at this point like it should be a really happy story. I come out of the interview room, I go in the briefing room, and they're watching, the investigative team is watching the interview, the Crown prosecutors are there, everybody's kind of doing high fives, oh, this is great, it's fantastic, good job, Bill. And I come out and I'm mentally, emotionally, and physically exhausted. The team commander's responsibility at that time is to assign all the tasks that need to flow on the heels of that confession or inculpatory statement. And those things didn't happen. They didn't happen because the team commander, for all intents and purposes, was checked out. He was done. A couple, hour, a couple of weeks later, I was at the swimming pool in Ladner with my son Liam, and Don was with me and his daughter Maddie. And Don said to me, he said, Billy, what's bugging you? And I said, what do you mean, what's bugging me? I told you Don was a polygraph examiner, right? <laughs> I didn't answer his question. And he said, exactly, Billy, what's, what's bugging you? And I went on to tell him that I felt like I had the weight of the world on my shoulders and that I had made mistakes. And with us sitting in the pool in Ladner, we created, came up with the concept of creating an interview team to provide support to uh, police departments on the most high-risk, high-profile investigations that they may uh, come across. Created an ad hoc interview team that has since gone on to help provide the interviewing model in North America, has helped create uh, many of the cases and the case law that guides police interviewing and the boundaries that we have to work within to gather admissible evidence, have helped eliminate people that were falsely accused of crimes, and it has helped people take responsibility for their crimes. A couple years later, uh, I transferred from Burnaby, and I was a polygraph examiner, 
working as a polygraph examiner, I was over on Vancouver Island and I was teaching an interviewing course and I got a call from a gentleman who was in charge of the major crime unit in Kelowna. And he told me that a young girl, a 16 year old female, Cherish Oppenheim, you can see her picture uh, behind me, a beautiful young uh, girl, was last seen around midnight in Merritt. Also observed around midnight was a male by the name of Robert Deswan. He was on parole and he was driving a van. Cherish had been drinking. Every parent's worst nightmare. Your 16 year old girl is out late at night, she's been drinking, and there's a sex offender in the van. <clears throat> so they asked me if I would come and I would help them. In my heart, I believe that uh, she was dead. But you know, if I can help, I'll help. I'll do whatever I can do. So I drove from, I took the ferry across from uh, Victoria to the mainland here, Vancouver. Drove up to Kelowna, got there late at night, Friday night. Saturday morning, I started reviewing the case facts uh, in preparation for this interview. I pulled him out of the room, and I talked to him through the better part of the day until late at night. And he was that he had a schizoid personality disorder. He was choosing not to um, unburden himself, if I can frame it up that way. So we shut the interview down late at night, went back to our hotel, got some sleep, came in in the morning. And I can tell you that our team was pretty defeated. You know, he was very strong, no uh, effect to him at all, didn't appear to care about much except himself. Ultimately, we re-engaged in the interview process, and at about three o'clock or so, he decided to um, take responsibility uh, for what he had said, what he had done, I'm sorry. And he told me that he had uh, buried her up in the woods uh, outside of Merritt. So I said, okay, we're going to get her. So. Out we come into a police car. Him and I are in the back seat. Some two guys are driving us. As you can imagine, a bit of a convoy behind us. Everything is being audio and video recorded. We leave Kelowna. We drive up to Merritt. We get off on Coldwater Lake Road. And um, we get out of our car and we start walking up um, a logging road. And we're walking up that logging road, and it's uh, myself and Deswan, and then the uh, the team behind us with a video recorder. <clears throat> and we walk about a half an hour into the woods. And as we are approaching the crest of a hill, out in the middle of the logging road is a deer. And it's staring right at us. And I said to Deswan, I said, Robert, Cherish's spirit is in that deer. And then about you know, 30 or 40 feet over to the side. I saw some freshly displaced dirt. I, I went over and I, I moved the dirt with my hand and uh, the, I found Cherish. <clears throat> so I then had a discussion with Deswan about what he may or may not have done to her after he took her life. We're then now seized with having to speak with her family about what's happened. And, you know, we have to deal with the next of kin and we have to tell Cherish's parents that their worst nightmare has, in fact, come true. So we do that. We go and we speak to Cherish's family. And in the throes of that next of kin, uh, the family's made aware of the deer. And the fact that it was right there where uh, we recovered Cherish. And as you can see, she's a, a First Nation. So... It's of significant value or interest to the family, and they end up carving a deer into her coffin for her uh, service. So all the evidence that flowed of that, from that investigation essentially flows from the interview, two-day interview. So there is a trial set. The person, Deswan, then pleads not guilty, and we go to court, and I'm subject of extensive cross-examination. And when a police officer is in cross-examination, 
with the defense counsel, I'm not supposed to talk about my evidence. I'm supposed to tell the court what my evidence is. So the, the courtroom is full every day, and in the front row are Cherish's parents. Shelley is her mother. And at one of the breaks, they come out to me, and uh, Shelley asks me if she can talk to me. So I'm not supposed to talk about my evidence. I'm not going to offend her when she's lost her daughter. And I say, okay, yeah, I, I'll talk to you. I can talk to you. So she said to me, this is what she said to me. <clears throat> I want you to know that I pray for you every day. It was like she took a knife and stuck it through my heart. Or I was struck by lightning. Because here's this lady who's lost her 16-year-old daughter. And she's telling me that she prays for me every day. And uh, the reason I tell you that is because when I talk to police officers about interviewing, or I talk to police officers about leadership or about major case management, I tell them that story and I tell them to never ever forget who they work for. We work for the community and we work for the victims and we work for the families. So speaking of <clears throat> victims or families, and Mark referenced it earlier, um, I was involved in the investigation and the interview of uh, Robert Picton. As you know, uh, Robert Picton was ultimately convicted of six counts of second degree murder for young women that he, he took not far from here, frankly. When he was ultimately found guilty, and I, I was sorry, I was uh, part of the court process and gave evidence and whatnot, and I had a long kind of standing interactions with Picton at the time. But on the footsteps of the courthouse, after he was convicted of six counts of second degree murder, I, I can tell you that I wasn't particularly pleased with the outcome. And uh, sorry, at this, by this point I had uh, received a number of transfers and I was uh, the operations officer at the Integra Integrated Homicide Investigation Team. So my job was to oversee the homicide investigations in the Lower Mainland. So when I came out of the courtroom, I wasn't particularly happy and I was subject of a media scrum. And in an unfiltered, honest way, I shared my thoughts about that. And when I woke up the next day and I saw the front page of the paper, I thought, oh boy, I'm gonna be in trouble. Because I was not the spokesperson for the RCMP. I was not the media person for the RCMP. I'm a cop. And it um, wasn't my role to speak about these matters. So coincidentally, I got a call later that day I got a number of calls, but one of the calls, <clears throat> one of the calls I got was from Bev Buss, our former commissioner. And to my surprise, she told me that she was proud of me for what I've said. In spite of the fact that I was not the media relations officer for the RCMP. I then continued to work in IHIP for about five years. I transferred to Surrey Detachment, where I was in charge of investigative services, and my role was to oversee all the plainclothes police officers, or what American television would probably refer to as de detectives. So I think it, it would be fair to say that during the course of my career, <clears throat> I was primarily focused on gathering evidence, trying to advance prosecutions against people who had taken something from somebody or taken somebody's life, leaving crushed families and uh, broken hearts uh, in their path. I was not a media relations officer. My experiences provide me with uh, a degree of respect within my work environment and the legal community. But in no way did they really prepare me for what I'm about to describe to you. In 2012, about four and a half years ago, I assumed the position of officer in charge of Surrey Detachment, which is the largest 
uh, detachment in the country. In my first year and a half in Surrey, we had 30 murders, uh, the majority of which were uh, drug and gang related, but also included the likes of uh, Serena Vermeersh, a 16-year-old girl, and culminating with the uh, tragic murder of a woman by the name of Julie Pascal, who was uh, known in the media as the, the hockey mom. As a result of that, uh, I was facing a significant public pressure, significant political pressure. I had a workforce that was very tired, and we were under-resourced. And I can tell you that during the course of my career, I've been a demanding leader. And on occasion, I've hurt people's feelings. My desire to succeed or to win has been both a source of strength and a source of weakness. I needed to transform myself, what I will call a functional or tactical leader, to one that was strategic, focused on the future, one that could <clears throat> um, help inform public perception or um, have people feel safe in their community. I needed to be able to navigate the political realities of my position. And I needed to unequivocally embrace the notion that uh, leadership can be lonely and is, in fact, so what I did was I advanced two separate initiatives. I brought in external bodies to do a complete 360 analysis of our detachment, our service delivery model, which is risky as a leader because what I'm essentially doing is exposing myself to criticism, um, to be exposed as maybe a failed leader, um, to be the person who's ultimately accountable for all the things that are happening in our community. And I also, um, fully supported an internal survey of the men and women that worked in the detachment, the uh, police officers and the municipal employees, every person that worked in our building, where in that survey they were given the opportunity to provide open-ended feedback with respect to what they would do if they were the boss, and if they could change one thing, what they would change. I did not view these as factors that I needed to fear. Instead, I viewed them as opportunities that, would that could potentially provide me with significant personal development and could enhance the service delivery for the men and women that I served with and the community that we serve. In essence, it was a report card on all of us. It wasn't, um, at the end of the day, a report card on Bill 40. We then moved forward with nine sessions where every employee in the detachment was part of a significant change management initiative, whereby we looked internally, we looked at our service delivery, I'm sorry, and then we looked at our people or ourselves. And as part of our service delivery, because over 60% of the calls for service that we respond to as a police agency don't actually involve crime. They flow from social issues like homelessness, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, mental health, concurrent disorders where we see multiple facets. We then move forward with the creation of a number of different units that were designed to deal with the vulnerable people in our community. We created a vulnerable persons unit, uh, a domestic violence unit, the first of its kind in the province where we integrated and co-housed social workers, corrections officers, police officers, Surrey Women's Center, to provide a sweet wraparound for victims of domestic violence. It was the first of its kind in British Columbia. We recently created a diversity unit, which is the first of its kind in the RCMP, with a specific focus on trying to educate our police officers and do outreach to the community, driven in part by the uh, Syrian refugees coming in to Canada. And in our detachment, we created flyers or pamphlets that were shared with all police departments across the country, 
And also, um, on an international level, we sent police officers over to Jordan to deal with Syrian refugees before they ever came to Canada so that we could help them understand the Canadian culture and what law enforcement might be to them when they came. We, pre we prepared coloring books. We prepared all kinds of materials that would help them. We reached out to the other communities in Surrey that spoke Arabic so that when they came, they would have a sense of how they could help welcome people. And I guess the other thing that we did that's kind of meaningful is we created a model called the Surrey Mobilization and Res Resiliency Table. It was bringing together eight different social services providers to identify those people that are most at risk so that we could get them the support they need so they never get arrested and become part of the justice system. We were trying to move our, our service delivery upstream to provide support to people before they get involved in the criminal justice system and all the trappings that flow with that. I also focused on our team. And I asked every supervisor to do a 360 on himself. So rather than have your supervisor assess you, have your people assess you, how, they're, how they think you're doing. <clears throat> One of the biggest issues that was identified in our internal survey or I guess three of the issues were, one, people wanted to be a part of a functional team. They wanted to be treated respectfully. They wanted supervisors to hold people accountable. They wanted to be respected, frankly. So I looked at creating a leadership training initiative for all of our supervisors. And we organized it, and they came in. All the supervisors came in. It was a room like this, about 50 or 60 people. And I opened up the uh, two-day session, and what I told them was that I was not going anywhere. I was committed to making this the best place to work uh, possible. And I told them why. I told them I, I applied for this job. I went through psychometric testing, which I was worried they may fire me when they got the results, but I went through psychometric testing. I went through extensive interviewing, uh, significant reference checks. In other words, I applied for this job so I own all the responsibilities that go with this job. And I asked each of them to assume that approach to their job, because every one of them applied for promotion at some time in their career. They didn't get a, uh, a magic wand, OK, you're now a, a corporal, a sergeant, a staff sergeant, inspector, a superintendent. I asked them to assume responsibility for the position they were in. And at the end of that night, or at the end of the day, I was at home, and I was thinking about the day and what had taken place. I can tell you, I wasn't happy with my message. It, it kind of came to me that I, I talked about management. I truly didn't talk about leadership. And I believe that all the men and women that I work with, and probably in your respective um, workplace, they want to be led. They want leaders. So I called up the people that were uh, facilitating the course for me. And I said, I'd like to come in again and speak to the group again. Are you OK with that? And they kind of said, well, yeah, you're the boss. Like, go ahead. So I went in, and I said to the group, um, so there was something I didn't tell you yesterday that I want to tell you. And they kind of looked at me. And I, I'll tell you what I said. I said, uh, I have blood clots. When, when I go to bed at night, I don't know if I'm going to wake up in the morning. And when I learned that I had blood clots, I didn't tell my boss. I went to the commanding officer of British Columbia, and I told him. And the reason I told him was because I didn't know what they would do. I thought, you know, one, if something happens to me, they need to know. But what if they want to remove me from my position? Because the largest detachment in the country needs to be run efficiently. And he showed compassion and, and care for me. And he reaffirmed for me why I spoke to him. And maybe I'll just pause and I'll ask you to ask yourself, why do you think Bill went to that guy? The, the reason I went to him was because I trusted him, because he was trustworthy. 
I then had a discussion with the team, and I asked them to answer four questions. I asked every one of them to ask themselves if they're trustworthy. I asked them to ask themselves, do you honor the absent? In other words, when somebody leaves a room, do you disparage them or malign them? Because when you do that, and I'm in the room, all that tells me is when I leave the room, that's what you're going to do to me. Do you put unspoken conflicts on the table? If Mark and I see an issue differently, am I willing to put it on the table with Mark to have an honest discussion, open-ended discussion with that? And the last question was, do you blind copy messages? And I described for them how one time a staff sergeant was providing constructive criticism to his team and blind copied me, thinking I would be impressed. And I hit reply all and said, it seems as though you blind copied me this message. They didn't blind copy me anymore. <laughs> but I, I asked those questions because as I, it occurs to me why I'm here today, really, I could have said, are you a transparent leader? Trustworthy and transparency, in my respectful view, are the same thing. Moving aside from intern inside the organization to outside the organization in the community. <clears throat> Each of you probably has your own perception of crime, public safety, and policing. As a police chief or a, a, law enforce, a leader in law enforcement, it's my job to understand your perception. And understanding your perception can only come through listening to you and engaging with you. Last year in Surrey, we had a series of shootings that took place, caused significant public and political concern. The individuals involved in these shootings in the drug trade are drawn into that by the illusion of money and you know, women and cars and everything, all the trappings of power. But at the end of the day, reality is much different. In that particular case, the victims were not cooperating. They were telling us things like, oh, the bullets fell from the sky. You know, I accidentally got shot. I don't know who shot me. And it was creating a significant roadblock for us in the investigation, because if our victims aren't cooperating, what are we investigating? What we really are is trying to take these people off the road to ensure that we don't have an innocent person shot in the um, crossfire. So I made an unconventional decision that I knew would be unpopular and I knew would be criticized. I published the photographs of the victims, reaching out to the public and asking the public to provide us with any information they may have with respect to the victims. One of the other added benefits of that is it's a bit of a public warning to anybody that may be associating with these people that you're putting yourself at risk by hanging out with them. We then um, engaged in a fairly significant community outreach initiative where we held public forums. Um, one in particular, we had a thousand people into a stadium where I stood in front of them and I said, we must do more. I asked for their assistance. I asked them to share responsibility for public safety with the police. People are the police, the police are the people. We launched upon a significant neighborhood safety campaign where we held 22 or 21 uh, open houses in specific neighborhoods to bring people in and talk about the issues that were c of concern to them. We thought we knew what the issues were, but when we heard from people, we heard very different stories and we launched upon a pretty significant outreach where we made ourselves available to the media and all the potential criticism that may come with that. And in, at the end of the day, we ended up stopping the shootings and securing the trust and confidence of the community. Fast forward to this year, shooting conflict emerges again. Same problem, different people, coming in to fill the void left by those that have been, have chosen to leave the lifestyle. One of the things that presented itself during the throes of this shooting series though, was the media began to misrepresent the number of shootings 
that were taking place. Point of fact, they were underreporting the number of shootings. And I came back from vacation, and, and during, while that period that I was away, there was a significant number of shootings. So I was seized with the decision of do I allow the media to underreport, or do I set the record straight and deal with the resulting public concern? There was no, no doubt in my mind what we were going to do, and I told our our staff uh, pretty clearly that what we were, were going to do is we're going to set the record straight. We're not going to allow the media to misrepresent. I would rather be criticized for the number of shootings we had than be criticized for not being transparent and honest. So we did that. And in the days that followed the uh, release, because we got significant media coverage, we very quickly identified the people responsible responsible. And the community's response was much more focused and in line with what I hoped it would be than it was the year before. The confidence that we had secured the year before and the, the trust and the connection paid off. And the second year, it was not, this year was not viewed simply as a policing problem, it was a community issue. We very quickly identified those people advanced a number of investigations to help uh, take them off the streets and support prosecutions. So does that mean and, and eliminate the potential perception of this ongoing problem? So I ask you, does that mean that the crime stats don't matter? It's all about perception of crime. I, I think the answer to that is yes, and the answer is no. They matter in the sense that crime stats will help drive the service delivery of the police force, but they don't matter if what you're doing doesn't make the community have a sense of comfort. And it doesn't give them a sense that they, they should be safe. I've learned through my career that we actually have to be mindful of both sides of the coin. We have to be very strategic in how we assign our resources but we have to be very mindful of how the community perceives our response. Having said that, the police and the police leaders can only police and only be police leaders if they have the trust and the confidence of the community. This, I believe wholeheartedly that this sense of trust can only be maintained by being open, honest, and transparent. As I wrap up, and I think I'm still on Okay, okay. As I wrap up, <laughs> I want you to know that uh, Canada has extremely skilled police officers, both in the RCMP, at the provincial level, the national level, and at the local level. And I want you to know that I have tremendous respect for Adam Palmer, the chief of the Vancouver Police. I think he's a tremendous leader, and I think he's a principled leader. The police officers that work for you are uh, sought out by law enforcement agencies across the country and internationally based on their skills and abilities, uh, their ability to drive meaningful files. I can tell you that uh, we deserve some of the negative media attention that we get. But we do a lot of things um, really well. And I have complete confidence in the men and women uh, that I work with. We aren't perfect. We can do better and uh, we will do better. Needless to say, crime does not work on a timetable. It doesn't respect geographical boundaries. So the men and women that I reference in this discussion they don't work an eight-hour workday. They don't work five days a week or four days a week. They're, they're 24-7, all consumed in their job. I'm very proud of them, and I can tell you that they're also very proud to serve you. Maybe the last comment I'll make is um, to you is that I commit as a place leader 
to never ever forget how I felt in the hallway of the courthouse when I was speaking with Shelley Oppenheim. Uh, we are uh, your police force and we are very uh, proud and feel privileged to serve you. So thank you for having me and I'll take any questions later, I guess. Um, can I go first? <laughs> so, no. <laughs> so here's what I, okay. Okay, sorry. Policing in Canada seems to be, and forgive me, I'm a lay person, I'm not, I'm not, not an officer, mm -hmm. seems to be very, very different from the leadership all the way down to recruitment. Um, very different than what's happening in the US. And they're paying mm -hmm. an awful price for it right now. Mm -hmm. I imagine you have a thousand opinions on, on that. You, now, have you, you've done some work down in the States. You've had some experience with it. Do you have mm -hmm. some perspectives on what the hell is happening down there? Yeah, I, I do. I, w I wouldn't want to be seen to be judging what's happening in the States, but I, I, maybe I'll take a, a second to provide you with a quick story from when I was down there and then why I think we're different and some of the things that are different. I was working um, one day and a, a gentleman traveled through BC from Alaska to Washington. And while he was driving through, he, I'll, I'll try to be really quick, he killed somebody. And he was arrested in Sacramento, California, and I was asked if I would go down and interview him. So I went down to Sacramento, California, a big uh, maximum facility, maximum uh, security facility, like you see on television. And I have no sense whether or not he's going to talk to me, but it's worth a shot. So when I, I pull him out and I talk to him and I set up our recording equipment, I spend a couple hours talking to him and he ultimately tells me that, yeah, he, had, he did kill this uh, gentleman. And I was worried about, so I, I went back to the hotel that night and I was worried about the admissibility of that because he's arrested in the States where they have the Miranda. In Canada, we have a different set of guidelines that are driven to ensure the evidence. So I thought, I'm going to go back and talk to him the next day. And I went back the next day and I set up the recording equipment again. And I said to him, essentially, you know, I'm really worried that what happened yesterday is not going to be admissible because everything that I'm saying to you, I, I want to go to court and be used as evidence against you. And I'm concerned about the Miranda and the Charter. And I don't know if you were given your Miranda rights and if you understood that and what that means in the Canadian context. So I walked him through that and, you know, it took 15 or 20 minutes to kind of walk through that. And then I said, okay, now I want to talk about the murder again. And I thought, there's no way this guy's going to talk to me after I've just said all this. Well, he did. And he talked about, about what he had done and, again, took responsibility. And then at the end of that exchange, he said to me, he said, you, you know, Bill, you, you seem like a pretty good guy. I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> he said, uh, he said can, I, can I tell you something else? I said, oh, you tell me anything you want. He said, I killed before. I said, okay, do you, you want to talk about that? <laughs> he said, okay. So then he proceeded to tell me that he had killed a guy in Colorado. And I thought, oh man, now I'm in real trouble. I don't, I'm talking about murders in the States and I want it to be admissible. I, I don't really have a lot of experience in this area. So I, I let him tell me about what he had done. And then I went out and got the FBI guys that were kind of escorting me around. I said, like, you guys need to go in and talk to this guy because he's killed somebody. And I have no idea if what I've done is okay in your courts. So we did that. And then I got a notification to go to court in Colorado. And I went there. And it's just like you see on TV, the big eagle in the room. And <laughs> I went in and the judge, you know, you put your hand up. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And I said, yeah. So then the... Uh, District attorney says to me, is what you did admissible in Canada? And I said, well, yeah, based on my understanding of the law, and I give a couple of cases. And the defense counsel, that's not what they call him. I'll call him the defense lawyer. He says, objection, Your Honor. This man is not a judge. He can't tell us if this is admissible. The judge says, overruled. And so, yeah, it's admissible. And then I, I finished giving my evidence, and I thought, wow, this is a really kind of an interesting experience. I walked out in the hallway, and the judge came out to see me, and he says, 
wow, it was an honor to have you in my courtroom. In the United States, they don't videotape what they do. Well, some, some places do, but not, it's not common practice to be transparent and open with what you do. Whereas in Canada, that is absolutely the expectation, which helps um, build trust in law enforcement. That's one thing. The other thing that I think is different in Canada is people like myself and other police chiefs, we have advocated for independent oversight by units like the IIO. So if the, uh, the police are involved in an incident, we want somebody else to come in and investigate us so that the public has confidence in the outcome. And it's a transparent investigation. Now, one of the challenges now is that those investigations are taking a, a lot longer than we had hoped. We can't control that. We've given that to them. We want them to own that. So I think that's a, a key factor. Another factor might be that you know, we're not elected in as a sheriff or as a, a police chief in Canada. I'm not elected in. I'm not subject to that type of a process. Some, some communities, that's the practice in the place in the United States. Um, if I, if well, I wouldn't know how to write a ticket, but if I was to write a ticket, the revenue doesn't come to, you know, the Surrey RCMP. I think that's a, potentially a factor in the United States. But you know, I don't want to. Judge them, but there are significant trust issues, and I think, you know, the, the matters that we're speaking about today play a significant role in that, and that's transparency. That's a really good answer. Hi, uh, my name is Godfrey, and uh, just a follow-up question that uh, is, is kind of relating to that. Like in the U.S., my understanding is most of the courthouses do have cameras, and you can access those on the internet or some channels mm -hmm. and stuff. Do you think that level of transparency would be helpful here in Canada? So you mean court cameras in the courtroom recording the? Yeah, recording the trials. The trials. Oh, OK, that's interesting. Um, I guess that would enhance the public's knowledge of what takes place in a courtroom. The public can access a courtroom. I, whenever there's a trial, but that means they have to actually physically go down there and, and be in the courtroom as opposed to the method that you're describing where they would uh, place it in. I, I think it, it might enhance um, public's awareness of what takes place in a courtroom. W would you encourage people to go down to the courtroom and watch a criminal case? Uh, I would say it's interesting, but be prepared for a slow process <laughs> that is often very technical and it's not as exciting as uh, depicted on American television. Hi, thanks for sharing um, some of the stories and giving us a glimpse into the work that you do. Um, I work in crisis intervention and suicide prevention mm -hmm. and I know that um, certainly we do involve police in mm -hmm. some of the things that we do. Mm -hmm. Um, earlier, you spoke about some of the collaborative efforts that you have uh, with other organizations, mm -hmm. um, women's issues, um, mm -hmm. et cetera. And I'm wondering if you can speak about mental health and the intersec intersections with police work and mm -hmm. how it might be improving in any way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. And I think what we've seen in law enforcement in the last 10 years is mental health is playing a larger role and we're becoming more engaged in um, trying to work through those issues. Internally, what we're, we're trying to enhance awareness of matters relating to mental health. We've created a unit in Surrey specifically to deal with people that are subject or have concurrent disorders. We have 24 hours a day a nurse and a police officer on duty to deal with uh, mental health issues or high, or calls where mental health issues are, are a potential contributing factor. It's something that has come onto our radar in a pretty significant way the last decade and continues to become a bigger issue. And we continue to invest more energy and training and discussion around that. The other side of that, frankly, is the hardest thing I ever dealt with as a cop police officer, sorry, um, was the death of one of my own members. And when we talk about mental health issues, you know, the mental health of the men and women 
that are on the road is also something that we need to have honest discussions about so that they're also getting the support they need. You know, there's nothing like walking down a hallway in a police station and seeing 50 cops crying. It's crushing. And that's, you know, what I've had to experience. And bringing in people to talk to them about that and to reduce the stigma with mental health and talk openly and honestly about it. Um, so we're, there's two sides. One, we need to be continue to be engaged with our community and trying to find solutions for these people. Sometimes, you know, they need help. They don't need to be arrested. They don't need to go to jail. That's our smart table. That's the, that's the vulnerable person section. That's our mental health liaison officer. We're all, we're trying to do that. If we do that, we get them the help they need. A byproduct of that is we reduce the number of calls for service that we have to go to. It's a win-win for everybody. It's just a matter of us continuing to invest energy in that very important issue. Thanks for that question. It's, uh, it's great to hear you speak and to know that uh, there's that level of transparency um, at, at the level that you uh, are at. Um, I'm wondering about all the recent um, allegations of sexual harassment by the mm -hmm. female uh, officers mm -hmm. what, and what's being done about that internally. Okay, that's a very timely issue because <laughs> our commissioner yesterday um, acknowledged a public apology to all the men and all the women, sorry. But I should say, you know, I should not preclude men from being subject to that as well, but primarily focused on the women uh, since 1973 when we changed our hiring practices and allowed women into the organization, invited them in. So I have an interesting perspective on this because my wife is a police officer. And for me, what yesterday means is I hope a reset for our entire organization. We need to acknowledge our wrongs, which you know, our commissioner did and which you know, I completely embrace. And we need to now make sure there's a framework in place that allows you know, every woman that may, may be the subject of that behavior to come forward in a manner that she feels is safe. And then based on, and I, I don't want to call them complainants, because they're members of my organization that have been wronged. That allows them to come forward, share their experience, and we have a professional response, response to that. If somebody has committed a criminal act, you know, we will respond in a very professional and proper way. We will, the other side of that, I hope, is it continues to drive the narrative around appropriate conduct and behavior by all of our men and women as an organization. And I, like again, I don't want to call them complainants. They're members of my organization that uh, chose to serve with me. And as a police leader, I have a responsibility to ensure that they work in the best environment possible. So I, I think, I hope you will continue to see that move forward. I'm very proud of how we've responded to these allegations and to these uh, matters. And, you know, like I said, we're not perfect. We've made mistakes, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably continue to make the odd mistake, but it, it will be important for us to, to respond in an aggressive, professional way. Bill, uh, thank you so much for sharing. Okay, sorry. Yeah, thank you for sharing your story. I would be very interested in knowing how much the intuitive and creative process figures into your interviews, in your investigations, mm -hmm. How much you pay attention to intuition? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great question because I think when we started interviewing, it was based completely on intuition and a gut feeling. I read a book called Blink many years ago that speaks to that. Uh, and so it, it, it does play a significant role. And I always tell people, if you have a gut feeling and it's telling you something, don't ignore it. But what I came to learn in interviewing is when you watch a lot of them, your intuition often uh, coincides with behaviors you're, that you're seeing. So you can measure some of the things that happen in a room, and people do. So one of the things that we did is as we were trying to become better interviewers is we met with social psychologists, um, people in marketing, people in sales, and people thought, you guys are crazy, but uh, there was so much for us to learn 
by reaching out and, and talking to others that are in either sales or, uh, you know, people in this room would be able to tell me things that, you know, the men and women that are cops and not no disrespect, to, but we all bring our own experiences and our own knowledge and we can learn from everybody, I believe. And in leadership, again, I, when our detachment was, I don't want to say crisis, but, you know, pretty close. I, I, I reached out to the academic community and asked for help and opened myself up to whatever they might bring to the table. Thanks. Maybe one or two more. I'll try to keep my answers shorter. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so building on that a little bit, you spoke earlier about the loneliness of your position at times, and then particularly um, when interviewing that feeling of exhaustion. Can you speak a bit about, and you did, uh, where you go for help, who you look to for mentorship, mm -hmm. and how mentally you recharge your batteries uh, mm -hmm. from the day in and day out of the job? Okay, thanks. That's a really good question. One of the things that um, perhaps I didn't do a good job of explaining was when Kim Tracy was taken from us and we did that process, I was, you know, a fairly competent interviewer, I think, at the risk of sounding um, cocky. But with the creation of our team, I came to fully embrace the notion that a group is better than an individual and that, you know, any one of us in the room could be the best person at what we do. But if we bring in a team of people and essentially play the devil's advocate and poke holes and you know the, whatever that smart guy or gal is thinking, we're going to have a better product. And we will ultimately uh, do a better job, whether that be public safety or sales or you know, marketing or uh, graphic design or whatever it is. So that's the first part of, of your answer. I guess the, the second part um, about what I do I would say I exercise, but as you can tell by looking at me, I haven't been doing much of that lately. <laughs> um, I got a dog, Gordy. He's the best dog in the world. <laughs> the wonder dog. You saw a picture of him. Um, you know, I just try to, as much as I can, <laughs> the guys at work are going to get upset with me when I say this, I deal with normal people, like people like yourselves, who bring a different perspective, like as police officers, we don't get called because someone got an A in their report card or did a nice deed. We get called because something bad has happened and there's the potential for us to become jaded and view a society as us against them. And in point of fact, that's not the case at all. One of the great things about the positions I've held is I interact a lot with the public and I get to meet great people every day and I get to hear positive feedback that the men and women working midnights don't ever get. So that's really a big part of it, is I try to consistently engage with normal people and, you know, which is, you know, when Mark spoke to me about coming here, I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah, I, that'd be awesome. So. One more, then we're going to go home. Here. Roger Killen. Roger. Whenever you make a transparent statement, that statement is interpreted by uh, those who hear it in their own way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of them respond in ways that aren't very helpful. Mm -hmm. How do you balance the benefits of transparency with the negatives of some of the unhelpful reactions that you get from those who hear your message? It's a great question. One, one of the things that I often say to people is communication isn't what I say. Communication is what you hear. So if you're not hearing what I think I'm saying, I need to change the narrative. I need to change the delivery. I need to change either the tone, the manner, the uh, means that's being delivered and not lose sight of what you really uh, need to say, what your truth is and uh, never uh, compromise that. I think if, if I understand your question properly. Amazing. Nice to see you, Roger. That's Rod, Roger, my friend here, is the producer of TEDx Stanley Park, actually. Pretty impressive guy. Well, sir, speaking of impressive guys, okay. we need to say thank you and goodbye. I have Thanks. a little...
thank you for you. Oh, thanks. Uh, I really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, go 40. Thanks so much.